So this one's going to be a little different from what I usually do for world binning videos. The dead giveaway might come from the fact that the horrid rule of cool is in the title. Yes, you heard that right, horrid. I have strong opinions when it comes to the, and I say this in the loosest sense of the word possible, value of the rule of cool. You might be familiar with this topic and are now scratching your head what this has to do with world building in general. Well, a lot. Basically, it is a giant trap that many fall into who are unwilling to do the proper legwork when it comes to establishing a setting and sticking with the rules. Before we get into the details though, I have to do a bit of exposition, for as I've said, this is not an ordinary episode. Me covering the rule of cool was not unprompted, as Shad from Shadiversity semi-recently shared his thoughts on the matter. If you are unfamiliar with him, Shad has a pretty good channel which mostly deals in medieval weapons, clothing, armor and life in general, as well as fantasy topics, world building and writing advice. In case you've never seen any of his videos, which I highly doubt, he is definitely worth checking out. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description, just in case. He is usually very insightful and knowledgeable, however I do not agree with everything he says, which brings us to this video. He is also occasionally factually incorrect. Again, there's a good reason I brought up this video. I'm not going to do a full-on response as I'd like to focus on my thoughts on the matter first and foremost, but I'll often be referencing his points as well. With all that clarified, what is the rule of cool beyond the bleak monument reminding me of the folly of man? It's not an old concept, so websites are going to be the main sources of information here. The one definition that I found on multiple pages, likely because it's been copy-pasted, is as follows. The limits of the willing suspension of this belief for a given element is directly proportional to its awesomeness. Stated on their way, all but the most pedantic of viewers, yeah, one of those, will forgive liberties with reality as long as the result is wicked, sweet or awesome. One more prominent explanation can be found in Victionary, which reads The principle that anything is acceptable to do, use, wear, etc. so long as it is cool. Now, the first one is going to be what I'll go by, as it refers to fiction in particular. What does this really mean though? Those who create it and advocate in favor of the rule of cool say that if something is particularly eye-catching, flashy, over-the-top or simply put cool, then general audiences are not going to care if it breaks some aspect of the established rules, and that's a good thing one can rely on. <sighs> Why the part that an average viewer is not going to care too much about breaking canon, the rules of physics or just common sense is true, it is definitely not something a writer should rely on. To properly explain the rule of cool, I think examples are the best tool. Let's see a normal person holding an ordinary sword, swipes at an enemy and cuts them in half. This is one of the less egregious instances and most people won't be bothered. However, in reality it would take much more than a slash to completely sever the torso of a human. The muscles, organs and especially the spine would be far too much for it to happen. Now, I highlighted that it is an ordinary person with an unremarkable physique and an everyday sword with no special properties. Of course, with incredible strength and sharpness, this may be possible, especially if we include fantastical elements. If these factors are already established, the rule of cool is not invoked, as everything makes sense in the context of the medium, internal consistency is unharmed, and verisimilitude is unbroken. However, such a setup has repercussions, affecting every scene the character and the sword appear in, as well as altering the world as now such extraordinary weapons exist. This is a lot of work, and may have an effect the writer does not wish to deal with, or in the worst case scenario, doesn't even think about. The rule of cool was made to hand wave such inconsistencies so that the impressive visual of a clean cut can be depicted or described. The point is that people won't care beyond the superficial aspect of the scene, which makes it okay that the writer doesn't care either, as only those pesky haters are going to oppose it who can't enjoy anything. Yeah, I do have standards and value those who take every part of their work seriously so that I can take it seriously too. Let's have a more significant and well-known instance of the rule of cool, an infamous scene which almost everyone laughs at due to its ridiculousness, Legolas running up falling stones. I don't think I need to explain how physics do not work like that, as I think the majority of people are going to leave a hand-shaped red mark on their forehead when they first see this scene, but I like to be thorough. 
So when a person leaps, they practically attempt to push the planet under their feet downwards. However, it is way too big to move, and since, according to Newton's law, when two bodies interact, they apply forces to one another that are equally magnitude and opposite in direction, the person is sent flying. Now, the most attentive of you might spot that there is nothing under these stones, so when Legolas pushes on them to try and leap, he gently accelerates their fall and keeps following them in their downwards trajectory. That's a dead elf if I've ever seen one, and I've seen a lot of dead elves. You're an ass and no nothing is justified, elves are extremely light, Tolkien said so. For those of you who are of this opinion, you might be thinking of the infamous section that states Legolas, like all elves, can walk on snow without leaving much more than a light footprint behind. Now, if we assume that that is their nature and not a result of an enchantment, that even with the weight of their equipment they are not heavy enough to compress snow more than a few millimeters, I have bad news for you. That's nonsensical in and of itself and has massive repercussions for the world. If elves are light as air, the first time they block a strike from an orc, they will be sent flying with the velocity of the attack. When they jump, they will have trouble returning to the ground as they cosplay a slightly deflated helium balloon. A slight breeze will blow them over like paper cutouts. When they sneeze, they are sent into orbit. Do you see the problem? This is one of the rare cases where the rule of cool is the only thing that can salvage the scene, as no explanation can exist beyond magic lol. However, it is too ridiculous to fool anyone but the most uncaring of viewers. Now that we know what the rule of cool is, let's hear what Shed thinks the rule stands for. So to start us off, what really is the rule of cool? It's pretty self-explanatory by the terms, and it's that sometimes we want to have something in a story, film, TV show, because it's awesome. And that's a great justification. If you can add something that is just has the cool factor, of course you want to bring it in. For the rule of cool to really work, whatever thing you're doing to raise the coolness factor, it either cannot sacrifice too much believability or realism, and realism is an important topic, functionality, you can push it to certain levels and, and get away with certain elements of unrealism because the coolness is so great people don't even notice what it's actually overriding to achieve it. But if you push it too far, where it's actually contradicting something really important, like a plot point in the story, like how the laws of physics work, how practical design is, it can go so far where suddenly instead of getting the cool factor, the reaction is that is incredibly dumb. Yeah, I'm sorry, but that's not the definition of the rule of cool. Our Aussie swordman here does lightly glance the actual meaning of the term, but falls short at identifying it fully. He might not have looked up the definition beforehand, but the real issue is that much of what he considers to be the rule of cool is kind of pointless, and definitely does not constitute the rule. The first bit is kind of nitpicky, but just adding elements one considers. Cool is not something that needs to be a rule of its own, as there is no benefit to such distinction. What is considered cool is completely subjective. Anything can be someone's thing from orbital lasers to orange socks. Some people are of the opinion that extremely venomous dragon snake rooster hybrids are very cool, others are wrong. I think that elements added to a story or setting are not solely dependent on their coolness factor, but the writer wishes to achieve with them has a far bigger role in it. Shed goes to the length of saying that adding swords if you think they are cool invokes the rule of cool, but there is no trade-off. First thing that I want to address is kind of the scale of what you need to sacrifice. Sometimes you don't need to sacrifice anything at all, just a little flair of whatever it is, and it raises the cool factor. For instance, I like swords. That's cool. I have a warrior. I have a sword. To me, that increases the cool factor, and I'm not sacrificing any. That's kind of a pointless rule to keep in mind, then, especially since it would be inconsistent what items or beings it applies to depending on nothing but the creator. Now, he does go on to say that adding something that would require justification is part of the rule of cool. While not completely accurate on the terminology, I do agree with him here, and he says a lot of good things. 
Indeed, I've already lightly touched on how the rule of cool can be voided if you provide explanation as to how the seemingly impossible, unlikely or illogical things happen or exist. Practically my whole channel is based around finding these explanations and justifications proving that mythological creatures could theoretically evolve and live on a fictional version of Earth, let alone a custom-made planet. This is where the art of world building shines. The broad line of hard work that separates hacks and artists. Sure, a significant portion of the audience might not give two shits about the mechanics and implications of a halfling squirting acid from its belly button, or how the unique culture of a nation worshipping tangerines develops, but the difference between a setting made by someone who cares and someone who can barely be bothered to justify their action figure smashing the storyline. God damn it, we want a zombie polar bear. Is clear as day. On the pinnacle of it all sit those with competence and attention to detail, who take great pleasure in handcrafting every block they build their castle with, characters, world, story, with a little sprinkling of theme on top. It's not only about what the audience may enjoy for a fleeting moment and forget it ever happened, but much more so about the movie, book, game or any medium that we can enjoy really dissecting, seeing how seamlessly the pieces fit together. Such experiences are rare for sure, as superficial disposable stuff is easy to make and earns just as much if not more money. But I digress. The point is that almost anything can be included in a story if it is justified and its implications logically affect the world. Well, me and Shed are at a bit of an impasse here, as he brings up one of my prominent grabs with entertainment, sound in space and how that's okay. Then there are ones that the trade-off is so minute that no one really notices. For instance, have you noticed that a lot of space shows have sound in space with the spaceships and explosions? That doesn't happen. Sound doesn't exist in space, okay? There's no atmosphere set for the sound waves to, waves to travel. Yet by adding the impact and explosion of many, you know, spaceships and everything like that, it creates a more dramatic and engaging experience doesn't apply always, but sometimes sound in space is not only really enjoyable, in certain instances you could almost say, uh, give an argument that it's needed to enhance the impact uh, and convey what's actually happening to the audience. And for that trade-off I've never really seen a problem. Now my rebuttal to his point is twofold. First off, it can easily be argued that an eerie silence with a large flashing explosion in the void of space can be just as effective as terrestrial sound effects. Additionally, it is a restriction that could inspire creative directing, maintaining realism while conveying the hectic nature of the action. For example, there is sound within the spacecrafts themselves, it is always an option to take the camera inside the cockpit, hearing the sound of alarms ringing, mechanisms clanking, weapons recoiling. All the while the fatal hit draining all sound from a spaceship is a chilling scene to witness. Second, the fact that the audience accepts it does not absolve it. It is still a mistake unless the setting specifically addresses it. It's a deviation from the world we know and such a simple change has massive consequences. Primarily, sound requires a medium to be transmitted through, which can be air, water, even solid objects. If there is sound in space, then there is matter in space. Matter that somehow shares the sound transmitting properties of Earth's atmosphere, while also being unaffected by gravitational fields and having no influence on space travel either, does such an issue make something categorically bad? No, of course not, but it is one notch on the tally of problems the world has. Some people might think this is nitpicking, and they may very well be correct, but as I've said, there is always a workaround. It can always be remedied with varying degrees of effort. Just throwing your hands in the air and saying, there's sound in space, don't think about it, is the easy way, but no one is going to admire your work for not caring about select aspects of it. There's only so many ways I can advise to strive to make something the best it can be, instead of good enough. Now, having talked about a semi nitpicky subject, I feel it is also important to mention the other extreme. Sure, the rule of cool is a terrible thing to have crawled out of someone's grey matter, but there is a danger to go too deep with writing or world building. While it is important to address or at least think about the implications of any change you make compared to our reality, as those are what make or break a setting, there are things you do not need to worry about, as there is a very deep rabbit hole gaping here. 
Focus on what is relevant, what may come up within a given story or things that may affect the world. Let's take a humble plant, for example. It is important to know what it looks like, where it grows, whom or what can eat it, its special properties. It may also be advantageous to keep notes that may come up in passing mentions, subtext, or help you keep track of the world you create. These can range from natural history to pollinators, stuff that is unlikely to be important but good to have in your back pocket, just in case. However, complicated stuff that will never ever be important or information that is inaccessible or irrelevant to the people of your setting are oftentimes unnecessary to even establish. For example, in a medieval setting, the genetic code of the plant will in most cases play no role. The chemical makeup of its enzymes is seldom of importance, as is the exact design of its various cells. Redundant information takes time away from more important work, all the while offering no return on the invested effort. Even I, as one of the most pedantic of assholes, would advise against working out such details. Sound in space does not fall into this category though. It's rather significant, regardless of how many people care or not. Moving on, here's what Chet has to say about expectations. There's another element that's going to be important in terms of what is really going to be believable, acceptable or passable in whatever story you're doing. And it's actually the audience expectation and standard of the story that you're making. And you're thinking, hang on, different stories and things have different standards? Yeah, they do. And sometimes these standards are created through past works in the same genre. Sometimes they're created through the audience perception. Uh, multiple things create these standards, but they exist. There is a different expectation when you go in and watch a Fast and Furious movie compared to when you go in and watch Lord of the Rings. And so the ridiculous things that happen in Fast and the Furious, we know it's for fun and uh, they're not caring about, you know, laws of physics and all that stuff because the film is trying to achieve a different purpose. But for a story that is trying to be more dramatic and wants more tension in the payoff and all these things and more immersion and more believability, suddenly it becomes very important to be consistent with the rules you're establishing. Well, I find myself disagreeing with him again. Expectations do not affect the quality of a story, only our enjoyment of it. Sure, subversion is a prominent thing in media, but unless it is properly set up, even if it surprises us the first time, it will have none or the opposite impact on a second viewing or reading. I mean, modern entertainment is often designed to be viewed once then promptly forgotten, but that's neither here nor there. So back to Shad's point, Lord of the Rings and Fast and Furious have massive differences in their tone and method of storytelling. Indeed, but just because I expect Fast and Furious to be utterly ridiculous and over the top, and it lives up to that, does not elevate it to the level of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Just because I expect the room to be the worst shit ever badged on film does not make it good if it fulfills that expectation. An inconsistency remains an inconsistency. Character motivations and arcs are not remedied by expecting them to be broken or non-existent. Disregarding the laws of physics does not make it any less of a lazy solution if I know it's going to happen. Sure, I might care less about such stuff in a Fast and Furious movie, but let's be honest, I'm not even going to care too much about the movie in the first place. Now, comedies are a point of contention for most things I mentioned. Some of the best comedies completely disregard reason and logic in order to make us laugh. However, one can easily separate the storyline, characters, world and jokes, taking a look at them individually. Their importance is usually not the same as for more serious media, but it does not mean they do not matter. Dramatic moments only have weight if the writing gives them said weight and the complexity they need. For example, a Naked Gun movie is not going to have a riveting story or stellar characterization, but these aspects are far less important as the comedy is at the forefront. Does that mean they should be disregarded? No, a talented writer may be able to thread a fine line where every aspect is good and well developed, and such efforts should be applauded. We've uh, strayed a bit far from the rule of Kudo. Another example Shad brings up entails Jackie Chan fight scenes, where people are extremely durable. A perfect example of this are, are actually the uh, fight scenes you see in a lot of Asian cinema, martial art flicks. I will refer to, say, Jackie Chan, The Legend of Drunken Master. There is a, a huge 
very unrealistic element to the film. And it is the truly insane durability of the primary character and the other characters. Uh, in reality, a very solid punch from a person, bare knuckled, can do serious damage. And then being hit with a bottle or something else can knock someone out in one hit. Yet in these fight scenes, we are seeing people get hit and hit and hit and hit and hit, and they're never going down. They're superhumans. Why do we accept that? There's a different standard for those films, and we can just go along with it, and it's fine, it's a martial arts flick. Again, it is an issue whether or not we can live with it. The writer and directors could have chosen to construct a specific movie in such a way that does not require superhuman toughness. They could have introduced elements that explain it, but they chose the third option and ignored it. Surely this should not be had as an example to aspire to. Now from what I know about Shed and based on many things he talks about in parts of the video I did not play here, go watch it, there is a link in the description, I'm fairly certain we mostly agree on a fundamental level. He does mention how he worked to explain and justify inconsistencies or oddities within his own story and world, so I am confident he does not live by the actual rule of cool. And I'm sure he does not mean this. It's great, use the rule of cool. We want the rule of cool, we want cool factor, okay? However, I do think being stricter and more consistent when it comes to evaluating fiction would do anyone good, especially if they are writer themselves. Also, always double check that what you think a thing is, is actually the thing and not something significantly different. Anyway, thanks for listening to my pedantic bullshit. If you like talking about world building, mythologies, monsters, or anything of the sort, come and join my Discord server where I collect minions for world dominant like minded people to have conversations with. There are still a couple days left before I close the poll on the next mythological creature I'll cover in the other series I do, so you can still vote on that one. Also, check out Shed if for some reason you haven't already. He has some really insightful videos just not this one. I uh, recommend the potion drinking one, as that's an interesting topic. Although he once again says that hand waving stuff is okay. I'll just let that one slide with a stern finger wagging clip. This is the end of the video though, I guess. Hope to see you next time, bye!